I guess very simply, what is, where are we? What is the state of the nation at the moment in terms of the gender pay gap? Well, James, as you mentioned, we've just concluded the fifth year of reporting mm -hmm. underneath the um, GPG regulations regime here in the UK, which, you know, for, as a quick reminder, is for all companies with um, over 250 employees who are um, required to submit their gender pay gap. Um, data annually. And just a quick look through some of those figures. So this is really kind of showing you the number of reporting organisations. Mm -hmm. um, what we can see is that big dip there in 2019-20, that was when reporting was suspended. Um, but it was encouraging to see that, you know, still nearly 70% of, of employers voluntarily reported. Um, and then we're back to kind of normal numbers now in 21-22. Mm -hmm. I also like to look at the number of employers reporting after the deadline. It's kind of a commitment to this kind of exercise for me. Um, mm. And we can see, you know, 4% reporting after the deadline, which hopefully suggests that employers have got their act together in terms of reporting and processes. Mm. It's worth noting, obviously, we're in April 2022 right now. April 2020 was obviously when the whole world came crashing down around us with COVID. It was, it was pretty much this week, I think, that we went into our first lockdown. So that was obviously influenced those results. Let's just take a quick look at um, uh, what we can see on the screen here, which is the median gap of 9.8% and that 78% of employers who reported had a gender pay gap in favour of men. Um, what does that tell us in terms of trends, Ruth? Where are we at? Well, I think let's focus on the, the blue box there. So it seems sure. to be showing that the median pay gap um, has closed from 10% to 9.8%. But we have to be really careful when looking at um, any of the data trends over this mm -hmm. period, uh, just because of the impact of everything that's been going on. Uh, we've seen this kind of false closing um, in a number of different data sets. And what has really happened is that we've seen a num you know, when we've seen a number of women who tend to be lower paid drop out of the workforce. And therefore, we've seen the average wage of women go up right. um, and become cool. closer to the average male pay. And therefore, that's kind of potentially a false representation of gender pay mm. gaps closing, because I don't think that really represents the real experience of women and their earnings during the mm. last 12 months. Mm. And, and and the the 8% that reported having no pay gap, is that is that roughly the same as where we were pre-pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, I did, you know, an analysis across the five years trying to find some illuminating insights and it was quite hard to find anything, you know, when we look at the average data. I think if you look at the next slide, we see the same kind of picture. This is really showing us, you know, across the five years. This is looking across the five years since the reporting started, Ruth. And what, what, have we, what interesting trends have you seen by looking across that whole data set? Yep. So we're seeing the median and mean pay gap here. So the dark blue line is the median pay gap. So if we look where we started, 9.54% for the median pay gap. And we are seeing that's actually got larger over the five mm. years of reporting. So 9.8%, we saw it went up to 10.5% in 1920, and then 10%. Um, so, you know, I, I find it hard to take away anything exciting from these figures. Um, and I know there are leading practitioners in this data set we're going to hear from sarah and david's going to share data with us on you know some mm. of the tactics that those leading practitioners are taking but i think you know whilst legislation is important and it does have um, it does have a positive impact it's still taking too long to address closing these pay gaps mm. and and what about the representation of women at different levels of the organization has that improved at all yeah, so one of the figures you have to report under the regime is the number of men and women across your pay quartiles. So mm -hmm. to do that, you line all your employees up and you divide them from the lowest to the highest paid into four quartiles, count the number of men and women in each quartile. And again, you know, showing the five years of data, my eye tends to draw to the upper, middle and top boxes mm. um, because we know that um, career progression and vertical segregation are one of the key drivers of the gender pay gap. Um, and are we seeing any significant change there? A very small change. So we can see, you know, women have gone from being 39% of the top pay quartile to today being 40.6%. So again, nothing to get too excited about, I would say, and a lot more work to do in terms of how we can make sure women progress into higher paid roles. Well, on that progression rate, it'll be 50-50 in what? <laughs> well, 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 I'm well retired, for sure. Um, yeah. uh, no, that's really interesting. Um, lastly, I just want to have a quick look at um, uh, bringing the, the ONS data as, as well. The reporting figures gathered by the Government Equality Office, uh, they're not the only source, are they? 
Yeah, it's useful to look across other data sets. So in the UK, we've got this other data source, which is the Office for National Statistics data over all earnings data. Uh, this is data mm -hmm. from April last year. Now, when we look at this data, it showed that the, the pay gap did actually widen in 2021. And again, there was a COVID impact there. In 2020, we saw more men furloughed than women, and we saw mm -hmm. the reverse of that in 2021. Um, so it would be really interesting to see where this goes. Um, I think if we consider the COVID period, you know, we, it'd be interesting to see whether there will be what we call a COVID dividend for women from the mm -hmm. mass homeworking mm -hmm. experiment. Um, and, you know, what employers will do now to leverage that. Um, will we see more advertising of roles with flexible working options? Um, and, you know, basically employers trying to tap into that talent market, uh, that the untapped female talent market. Mm. And we, we've talked a lot about flexible working and, and hybrid working on Inside HR over the last couple of years. Um, I know that we're going to explore a little bit more today as well, the interplay between family life and the gender pay gap, which is obviously related to the ability to work more flexibly as well. Are there sort of some clear stories there about how that's working at the moment, Ruth, from the data you've looked at? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, the trend data isn't showing us very much in terms of pay gaps closing. What's really interesting is to dive beneath that. Mm. Um, those average figures represent, you know, the experience over a woman's career. But if but that isn't the only experience. And if you tend to look at different points in a woman's career uh, where they may be impacted and men, in fact, for caring for children or caring for, for um, other family members, uh, then mm. we do see uh, pay gaps widen. So this ONS data chart, just quickly, you know, if we look at the top lines there, um, that that's all representing those three groups over the age of 40. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we can see the largest pay gaps in that data set. Mm. And I know that at Payscale, you do a lot of work over across the other side of the pond in the US as well. How is what you're seeing here, how does that compare to the trends that you're seeing in the States? Are they similar? Yep, definitely. You know, similar trends. We have a crowdsourced data set, so that's self-reported data for mm -hmm. represents about a third of the US workforce. Um, and we do our own gender pay gap report over that, which we release on um, International Women's Day. Um, and we did some interesting breakdowns this year into, again, what is the real experience for women, um, you know, due, uh, from, from a pay perspective. We did a piece of work on looking at the impact of um, unemployment, uh, because we know a lot of people have been out of work and are trying to return to the workforce. Um, and what we, you know, we did see that taking a break for family life seems to lead to a harsher setback in pay terms than for other reasons of time out. And that's what we're seeing there in the lower part of that chart. You know, we see an 8% penalty um, in terms of when you're returning back from work uh, because you've had time out to care for family. Mm. And, and and I know that there's um, sort of is, there isn't really a sort of federalized in the states reporting system in the way that we have introduced here. But what does this what we're seeing on the screen here? What does that mean in terms of gender pay in gender pay gap terms? Yeah, well, I, this is really basically saying um, the difference between women who are parents who report themselves as parents in our data sets and those who aren't. Right. Um, and we can see, therefore, that uh, if we look at the yellow bar for those that are who say yes, uh, their pay gap um, is 74% compared to uh, men. And uh, for the women that aren't parents, it's 88%. So we can mm. see that you experience a larger pay gap if you report that you, you know, if you are um, a parent. And I think, you know, we're going to come on to talk more about, you know, some of the tactics and things that we can do to address that. So I think, you know, my key takeaway here is continue to report, um, but mm. delve beneath the numbers and really start to look at some of those key vulnerable moments in the talent life cycle where pay can um, be interrupted um, and consider what you can do as an employer to um, rectify that. And I think we're going to hear more about that and it'll be interesting to hear the poll results. <laughs>